I'll I'll um put an intro video. All right. What is up? Welcome, Casper. How are you? Doing great. Doing great, Tim. How are you doing? Awesome. I'm great. Uh, I just heard you came from yet another podcast, so you must have your talking hat on for for us today. I always do. I always do. I know. Always um, happy to share my experiences and our awesome. experiences collectively. Yeah. Sure. Exactly. We're, we're quite close in what we're doing anyway. So, um, so what we'll do for this stream, I'll kick it off with a little bit of industry news and we'll have a bit of discussion. And then once we're done, maybe you can introduce yourself, see what you're doing, and then we'll just dive into the depth of composable stuff. So here we go. So let's start with some industry stuff because um, we're talking a lot about composability. And now that that has been solidly uh, been in place for a while, um, as it turns out, not everything that's being built at the moment is kind of easy to work with composability. Turns out it's not that easy to actually figure it out, but we might talk about that later in a second. And so at Uniform, where I work, where we're also hosting this live stream, is we're working in this digital experience composition, there's that word again, in that field. And it hasn't been as you know, known. And we feel like we're kind of the first one or among the first ones to do DXE. And so we had this whole thing we call DXE assembly in which we actually had a few keynotes about like, what is it? Some product um, releases, things like that, workshops. And so, Kasper, have you heard about this DXC thing? And if so, what do you think it is from your side? I have. And in, in my simple terms, it would be about composition management and how you actually orchestrate and drive experiences and start to orchestrate also the data that powers those. So it's the glue fundamentally of the entire Mach and composable architecture. And the interesting thing is, at this DXE assembly, we talked about glue code, and we almost mm. started calling it the glue code monster, because you kind of, as a developer, don't really want to be writing that glue stuff. You kind of just want to do the fun things, mm. where the glue should be hopefully taken care of elsewhere, where you sign an SLA, for example, right? It makes things mm. a lot easier. And so if anybody's interested in that, you can go to uniform.dev slash DXE dash assembly to kind of see all the talks um, that we did and see if that product actually fits for you, because it might not. And that's something we can talk about later as well. Um, then um, there's this really interesting article written by Dries, which is a Belgian name or Dutch, maybe. Um, he is the co-founder and CTO of Acquia. And um, he has this whole thing, like he calls it like a digital or composable digital manifesto or something like that, a very long read. And in it, he kind of outlines the, the new direction for Acquia and therefore Drupal. And um, this is a pretty interesting one, right? Because we've seen in the last few years, there's multiple like... I wouldn't call them legacy systems because they're still full on working, but they've been working for a long time, like 10 years. They've been amazing at the top of the market. And Drupal is one of those and the open source variant and with Acquia, the paid one. But then you have others um, like Sitecore, Adobe, now Optimizely. There's a few of them, right? And they're all kind of going into this space and saying, hey, we are composable because we did this, this, and this. And so, Gasper, how do you see this happen? If you put your Mac Alliance hat on, like, are they actually composable or is it close enough? Or like, what are your thoughts here? So obviously I need to call out that there is a distinction between composable and Menmach, right? Like that's also a spectrum in itself. Yes. Equally to there being a spectrum between best of suite and best of breed. But that's a detail for now. One of the major things that I feel will be very interesting to follow with these types of shifts and changes that happens within the, the typical best of suite space is the ability for these businesses to coexist alongside with other solutions in the architecture, like the openness of their tech and also their approach to market. 
And mm. I think, honestly, that's what's going to break it or make it for them. And I know some of our friends at Sitecore, as an example, like are very much embracing the fact that they don't need to be the only logo within the exactly. architecture. Sure. I think that's one of the, the, the most important characteristics of companies that can actually play within this type of an architecture. That is to acknowledge that you do not necessarily own it all. And neither are you the only vendor within this uh, solution of a potential business. And I'm looking forward to see how that's going to go for Acquia and also for Drupal. But uh, I do see, and of course, I'm also proud that these best of suites and these very established enterprise types of, of logos within the tech space are starting to embrace what we stand for as the Mach Alliance and are starting to align much closer to what the businesses of today are expecting of digital technology. Yeah, exactly. I, I think in a few years, it's all going to be like one happy party with everybody there. And you can still have a little bit of this monolithical stuff going mm. on if it's contained and you just connect to it. Everybody's happy. And I guess where it will make or break is how easy it is to actually connect to these and how if it's too tightly coupled, it might be complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I think and that's the certainly, one. Yeah, and there will certainly be certain uh, characteristics of that integration that need to happen, both within the vendor's multi-portfolio, meaning the way that, for instance, Sitecore start to integrate some of their data capabilities with some of their exactly. content capabilities, but also between vendors to make sure that you have a necessary amount of flexibility and that you can also shift and change your mind. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see when some of this is really being put in action, when it's being implemented in enterprise companies, and when you start to see it driving a bit of omni-channel experience too, then I think it's truly going to be put to the test. Yeah, and um, I guess um, they cannot just say, hey, okay, this is our new direction and alienate 10 years of customers. And that must be a hard place to be in, right? You cannot just go, okay, this is the direction. Now we're going to go that way. And bye-bye mm -hmm. for the rest. You have your legacy stuff that we will, you know, we'll give you updates for a year and then you're going to have to buy new things. Yeah, that's hard. So of yeah. course there's going to be hybrids. It's, I guess it's normal. Yeah, and so, it needs to be. Exactly. So maybe this is a nice bridge into kind of what we wanted to talk about today. But before I go into that, maybe you can talk a little bit about you, yourself and what you do, because you have so many fancy titles. Let's talk about that. Well, I'm happy to, uh, to give you a bit of background. Uh, my name is obviously Casper Rasmussen. I'm the president of the Mach Alliance, and I'm also global SVP of technology at Valtech, where I'm heading up our strategic business for Mach and Composable. I'm basically born and raised in the world of digital commerce. To be very honest with you, I care a lot about customer's experience and I care a lot about a business having the right tools in their hand to be flexible and agile and to unlock whatever business opportunity they need to unlock. As the president of the Alliance, I lead the strategy of the organization, but clearly I do that alongside with a member-led portfolio of companies that kind of collectively drive the Mach space forward and really help clarify what it means and what it's not. And then at Valtech, as I said, I lead our strategic pillar for Mach and Composable. So I also work hand in hand with a lot of international brands and big companies as a part of their Mach and Composable journey. So a lot of consulting and advisory, but also um, implementation support and really appreciate getting my hands dirty as well, because that's where the magic happens. Yeah, and that's where it gets interesting for me as well, because, of course, Valtech is one of the founding partners of the Alliance. Mm -hmm. And do you see, based on the DNA of how Valtech was, let's say, a few years ago, did you have some kind of clashes sometimes based on the type of customers and type of service Valtech would offer um, versus how the Mac Alliance sees things of how architecture needs to be? Was that complicated? Um, no, I wouldn't say, and it's still an ongoing process. So it's not because it has been overcomplicated up until this point, but we approach it from what we call a best for you attitude. And we go across mm. the entirety of the spectrum of best of suite to best of breed. And we understand that it's not a one size fits all, whether you're talking about more traditional monolithic channel centric solutions that are turnkey, or if you're talking about you architecting your own, or oh, you composing your own DXP and thereby yeah. taking a best of breed and a more Mach native approach. No one size fits all, meaning we of course still do business across that spectrum. And I also think it's important that we maintain 
the desire and need to do business across that spectrum because different businesses require different solutions and ultimately it comes down to their aspirations, their internal maturities, um, and, and there is space and room for all of it. I think it is pretty fair, and that just goes into your, your comment about Acquia earlier on, that some of the potential standards and practices and the approaches to engineering that you need to take with regards to Composable and Mach now also start to influence how we do business within the traditional practices within Valtech. It could, for instance, be how we actually do engineering and development within the cycle space. We need to start to embrace some of the same ways of working, some of the same standards and approaches to architecture, because, of course, the expectations from a business standpoint, as in our clients, are starting to actually greatly align to what the Mark Alliance stands for, meaning they also expect flexibility. They expect swappable components, that they expect something that provides omnichannel orchestration, like some of the same qualities are absolutely being expected, even though you are starting to see it being delivered by a different type of a vendor, a non-Mach Alliance vendor. I really like hearing this because I remember it's only a few short years ago that I worked at Valtech where we just started to become more global. Mm. And then we tried with a bunch of customers. We really tried like this value first approach that you're mentioning now. Like it has to fit you. Mm. And I think prior to that, it was not always that necessary because lots of clients just had this license of one of the three, four big ones, right? And so it's kind of like we can do amazing business transformation for you by helping you with your processes. And there's just the platform that we work in. And when I started, we kind of shifted a little bit to that value first thing. So maybe I was more in the frustration side of things. And now that kind of we have leaders like you actually pushing this so hard that it's much more normalized. And mm -hmm. I love seeing that. And I think that's where the future for agencies is because what do you think about all these agencies or like all these brands that now get much more in-house tech because they have to actually choose all these systems, right? And they have yeah. to do their homework and they, they cannot choose out of sheer FOMO in a boardroom anymore. Mm. Yeah. And so honestly, I, I, I feel it's a necessity at this point in yeah. time. And it's something I embrace, even though you can look at it and say, doesn't it go in and compromise the service revenue of an agency? Yeah, it does. But we're working on behalf of a brand. We're looking to commit to grow their business, right? Yeah. And internalizing a lot of that IP over time is an absolute necessity. Like even sometimes we talk about how a B2B manufacturing company going forward needs to be equally a software company. It's kind of mind-blowing yeah. the type of exactly. skill and capability crazy, right? internally they need to build yeah. in order to thrive in this world. We help them accelerate and introduce that capability and we help them evolve as a business, but we equally help them actually grow their own, um, I, I guess, skill set internally, their own standards and processes and their own capabilities to actually be a software company too. Should all companies be software companies? No, likely not. But there are certainly some companies that are looking to differentiate through <clears throat> digital services where that becomes almost a prerequisite in order for them to thrive. Yeah, and so now looking at these kind of companies that are like making their own choices and working with companies like Valtech. So to be successful in this kind of, let's say a commerce space, what would they have to do now or for the future that's actually different than they would let's do, let's say, three, four years ago? Oh, that's a loaded question almost. At least it's a I know. Fun. There you go, because you're <laughs> Mac and agency. So this is going to be fun. Go. Yeah, there you go. There you go. One vital step in, in my experience is to understand where you want and must differentiate as a business, meaning understanding what the customer expects of you and then also what role does digital play in your business strategy going forward is vital. And then you need to execute accordingly, meaning waiting for you to make a difference for your business because you need to migrate your CMS or because you need to migrate your website before you can do anything new. That's like more something that was present in the old world. I would say yeah. where now we're in the era of possibility where Composable and Mach can really unlock very creative scenarios of where you can actually put some of this technology investment that businesses are doing to the test and put it to market and thereby harvest and collect uh, potential um, uh, revenue or potential value from it. So identifying what matters to your company, sorry, identifying what matters to your customer 
where do you differentiate as a company and where do you stand out and then start to execute against it and really put that to market. I think that's the difference that is present today that wasn't a possibility five years ago. If you were to do that five years ago, you had to be a digital native company. You needed to be yes, the Amazons of the world that had all of the means, they had all of the skills in order to execute in that way, where composable and also what the Mach Alliance stands for by bringing forward like this ecosystem of members that can help you accelerate some of the core capabilities you need. That really makes it possible for, um, for, for, for businesses that maybe previously couldn't even do it or even consider doing it. Exactly. And I remember these kind of projects where we were with this a company that was also quite digital first, but they just had legacy software. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do a whole new redesign. And they're like, yeah, we're not going to wait for you for two years to rebuild this thing. We want to see changes every month. But we didn't have that much of the new stuff yet. It was just coming. And so we had this enormous complexity of actually training the teams on the old system to implement the redesign and then mm. also at the same time build a new system where we just build the new design. And then every few months we just swap out a page or a component and it would feel like the same site, only the new one was ridiculously fast. And the old one was very slow, but they looked the same. The yeah. amount of effort that went into that and then not even with the best results because you can imagine that these legacy systems just had a different approach to how you release and how it yeah. runs. And so that's actually where it becomes quite interesting. Like if you use Mac or composable technology, you, you don't just win because of the technology, right? Just yeah. putting these things together isn't actually going to make it very successful yet. So I had this recent epiphany when I was watching one of the Mac Alliance live streams with a customer. I don't exactly remember which it was, but it was a really good presentation from one of the customers that used Mac tools. When I looked at the website, I was like, did you really make a new website? It's kind of, did you? And then the guy was talking about the fact that their whole internal process had changed. Their IT team was suddenly liked again. Mm -hmm. They were Basically, instead of saying, maybe in six months we can add like a wish list or something, they would say, do you want it this week or next? And that conversation changed everything. And so mm. what is your view on how kind of this agility and the process um, gets better or worse, I don't know, with Mac technology? What do you think? Um, so it's really the difference between time to market and then time to value. And time to market, I think, is a, and people can prove me wrong here. Please comment if you see it differently. Time to market is about potentially um, migrating channels and putting digital estates or properties to market and thereby like launching something. Whereas yeah. time to value is these like incremental small steps that you can actually go in and execute as a business through this notion of best of breed and very flexible of an architecture. So how can you potentially go in and unlock more relevancy in your search? And how can you go in and do more targeted merchandising in the context of potentially a legacy commerce solution, but you're starting to implement or introduce that best of breed technology in that ecosystem, meaning you're starting your composable journey. I think that's the big difference to how these solutions should go to market going forward. And that's why I want to draw the line between time to market and then time to value because the steps within a plan to composable is much more granular than what we've typically mm -hmm. seen in a more yeah. uh, holistic uh, monolithic type of a DXP space. And then when you're starting to talk about potential innovation or agility, your release cycles becomes much smaller. The fact that you can start to actually influence just a subset of the systems that are involved opposed to kind of changing the, the gigantic monolith and, and, and kind of wishing for the best as you release out that change. It's those types of differences that matter. And it means that you can put things to market, you can release often, you can do it with confidence, and you can potentially also embark on multiple different uh, like programs of change at the same time. So you don't need to sit and manage dependencies and you don't need to sit yeah. and kind of cluster your work into major packages and ma major um, release cycles. So it gives the flexibility even in how you work as an organization and how you're implementing change across your architecture. We also see a lot of teams 
that are just doing more rapid release cycles and are doing faster innovation simply because they actually go into more of a cross-functional collaboration model where you start, because of the nature of the architecture, you start to actually see that you can work vertically across the architecture and all its layers. You start to actually do innovation on the front end, on your orchestration, within your SaaS and your microservices all at once. And you do that up against the customer's journey, meaning you start to actually release up against, it could be awareness and attraction, it could be uh, discovery and findability, it could be transaction, it could be post-sale and self-service. Like you're starting to really set up teams that are unlocking value to the customer in a particular stage of the actual customer's journey. So there are many ways of kind of approaching this. Um, but it all comes down to the flexibility and the decoupledness of the architecture. So you exactly. don't have two teams stumbling up, stumbling upon one another and needing to orchestrate the releases in too big a chunk and thereby going down that major release type of path that you often see with monolithic solutions because there is a dependency that you need yeah. to manage. I've seen it so often that a huge release, we had to be rolled back because it took so long that in Asia, they started shopping already. You're like, oh, mm -hmm. let's roll back. Otherwise, we cannot sell. And yeah. now, for example, where I work at Uniform, we are also very composed in our own software. And we sometimes do a release during a demo and it's fine because it's so tiny. It just works. And so I would almost say here that time to market is dead. I don't care about it anymore. Because you can go to market very fast with a crappy system, but it means nothing if it doesn't work. Mm. So you can do time to market very fast once you have set up your whole granular, fancy, com composable system, but it's so normal now, maybe we should stop talking about it. I yeah. guess. No, I, agree. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Maybe it's, it's, it, yeah, maybe it's a bit too radical. To put it that way, I like but radical. I but yeah, no, maybe I'll I'll, I'll I'll step it back a little. But I have some other things that might make it quite radical because you just spoke about all these layers, right? Of people mm -hmm. like you can release in the vertical and all these things have to kind of work together. Which the more composed you get, the more different all these things are. Like when you're at least in a monolith, you also have all these layers, mm -hmm. but at least they're all contained in one giant yeah. chunk, they, maybe three chunks, and they need to release together. That's kind of yeah, the they need to release together. That's a big right. difference. But the thing is, if something goes wrong, I can point the finger to the fender and say, yeah, it's, it's, it's broken. Mm. And they kind of have to scramble this with their support or with their professional services to kind of look at what you did and fix it. But when you have all these layers separated and mm. one breaks, it's your fault because you implemented it a certain way, right? And so... The more I worked with like composable tools and build projects, and I've done a, f a, a ton of them by now, the more code I wrote to actually make them stick together, kind of. Like, and it almost felt like I was building like a lovely Lego piece, but then actually using kind of hot glue to make sure that certain ones stick together really well, because mm -hmm. they always go together, and then other ones not so much. And then you start scaling, because maybe you have a multi-tenant site now. But then that one thing that I glued kind of needs to come off again, but it's really hard to do. And then you've kind of created your own problems. And mm. so how do you, have you seen this kind of stuff? Or maybe I should ask it differently. Like this is the thing, right? Everybody can see this in a different way. If you are a developer, you can be very idealistic and say, just write good code. So it's all fine. But not everybody is Netflix. Right, we kind of need to normalize this. And so, how in your mind does the Mac Alliance look at this stuff? First and foremost, we help businesses. These are the clients of Valtech and the likes understand mm -hmm. what solutions are actually fitting for this type of an architecture. And solutions are meaning software vendors, because there are okay. certain characteristics within a tool like it could be a uniform or it could be a tool within the content space or the search and merge space and so on that makes it just more compliant and fitting with the type of architecture we're talking about here sure. meaning in order for you to ensure things are decoupled having webhooks and having the right types of integrations and apis for uh, an event grid or an event system is a really good idea because that's the only way you make sure that your destination is not aware of of, of the source and so forth and so forth. So what the Mach Alliance help is just to demystify 
what MACH is and thereby also potentially shortlist or at least certify ISVs as an example as being fitting and compliant with this type of an architecture, meaning you at least have the opportunity to implement it according to the principles and according to the expectations of what MACH is. Clearly beyond that comes the implementation too, where it's important that you're also working with folks, whether those are your internal teams or those are your partners within, for instance, the agency space, to also make sure that it's being implemented correct. You're absolutely right in saying sometimes you can even see that Mach monoliths are kind of emerging out of projects because things ending up being too tightly coupled or things yeah. ending up not getting implemented in the most desirable way. And I'm sure most solutions have compromises because at the end of oh, the, must at the end of the day, oh, it's perfection is, is 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 also utopia, right? But there are certain places where simply you need to make sure you're kind of applying those best practices that we stand for, and also making sure that you're working with the right vendor or the right team or someone who has done it before. It could be internally too, to make sure this is also set up and configured and implemented in the right way is certainly also um, important. Yeah, I guess the, the flexibility is key everywhere. And then mm -hmm. it, you just have to be smart enough to link things together. Yeah. And so I have this kind of cheeky idea about what a CMS should be nowadays. And it only works in a few cases and it and it doesn't work in other cases because sometimes a CMS, like when you think about a Prismic or a story block, they're amazing to stay inside it. Because that's their whole thing with like amazing preview and stuff like that. And then you have others that are a little bit more open and wide ranging. But the mindset of people nowadays, because there's just no other way, is you build your page in your CMS. Right. And what that does, and I've spoken to lots of developers about this thing, is like, okay, so there ne for somehow people want a central place for things because we're used to that. Right? The decentralization feels awkward because everything is away. And so these headless CMSs, of course, their scope is relatively small. I have my domain data of my website or of my brand sits there where the content lives. Let's say you are an events website. So you have venues, you have artists, dates, and connections. You can kind yeah. of amazingly content model that in a CMS. But then when you build a page and a new event is coming up next week. You want to show that big on the homepage, right? And what everybody does is they add a checkbox in the data model of the event to say, it's now a featured event. And over the course of two years, there's going to be lots of drop downs and checkboxes. And then when you want to go multi or omni-channel, you know, you make an iPhone app or whatever, all these checkboxes make zero sense. Then you redesign. These checkboxes make zero sense. But in that same vein, you like, okay, but I need to get my products on the page. Let me mm. just integrate hard coupled into the CMS with some integration field to that CMS. And then from there, we also do an Algolia index or whatever. You see what I'm sketching here is kind of the spaghetti of everything, hard coded. And change is almost impossible. But the thing is, people are used to do this in CMSs. But in my opinion, they shouldn't do it. Because that's also now how they make their money. The more links and connections you make inside the CMSs, the more expensive they get. And this is nothing against them because it's a clear business model. It's amazing. But how do you see that? What would be the solution to that? Because if you do everything with code rather than you know, updating everything in the CMS, your content editors cannot do anything anymore. They just have to call you to say, hey, make me this page because I cannot yeah. do it in the CMS. But then the, the developer is busy. It's like, I'm in yeah. my sprint, bye-bye. Yeah. So how, how do you solve that? So I would categorize it as being experience management. It's the contextualization of all of the data that sits underneath. Like what you're trying to establish as a company would be a channel agnostic ecosystem of capabilities, right? This is about your promotions. Yeah. It's about your product information. It's about your assets. It's about your... Your, your content and so forth and so forth. It needs to be contextualized somewhere. There yep. needs to be some degree of channel centricity present within the architecture. It just should not sit in your central systems of, 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 of data like your CMS. So experience management, where you can actually start to combine those data sources and start to orchestrate them up against the actual customer's experience is where that should sit. Is that for every business? 
No, it likely isn't no. again. No, because no, we've learned this. It exactly. depends on, on, on the level of flexibility you're looking for. It depends on yeah. the internal maturity of your organization and how you think content. Lots of companies have their teams, and I'm talking about marketers and merchandisers, structured up against the channels, meaning you have an e-com manager for web and then you have an e-com manager yeah. for retail. And if that's the way you're structured as a company, then it's going to be counterintuitive to you as a business if you start to talk about central content, because who's going yeah. to own that? Who's going to optimize it? Who's going to refine it? Who's going to maintain it? So there is some degree of organizational change on the back of some of this technology transformation that we're talking about here in order to get to that type of an architecture you're talking about where it's like create once deploy many from a content yeah. standpoint but in my mind it sits with experience management as a term like i don't know if it's the right term or the wrong term i think it's so early on in the infancy um of, of it going to market and it being known as a definition but it's all about orchestrating those data sources and contextualizing yeah. them and being able to optimize them up against the actual channel and the customer's journey. Yeah, what I've noticed is once you have a little bit more scale, it makes more and more sense. Like at Uniform, where we do this stuff for the people that don't know that are watching, we've actually had customer conversations where it just didn't fit. For them, it mm -hmm. would be amazing to just have a CMS where the volatile content and your domain content, channel specific, just sits together. But yeah. then others that are bigger, we've spoken to people that have teams that approve content. They literally, their only job is to make content specific for behind the scenes stuff. They approve the languages, all the things. And they have teams that organize the search results. This shoe cannot be next to that bag. And for them, they have this very rich um, you know, ecosystem of where content lives. The only thing they need is a good system to put it together. And often these type of brands, if you look at the, um, you know, the luxury space or the fashion space, they don't even care that much about the flexibility of this component is here and I can drag and drop it because the president or the king of the fashion empire has decided this is where that lives. And so there's a real, um, you know, a fine line to find. Yeah. And once it works, it's amazing. Yeah. And if it yeah. doesn't, be, it's, it's hard still. But mm. what I love about all this is if you have like this agnosticity of these sources, they're just there and you select them, suddenly, because you're so agnostic, you have all the information in your hands and you can build, let's say, a preview that's universal. You can do personalization that's universal. You can make one SDK that talks to everything. And then you have so much freedom. It's very interesting. You just mm. have to see how it pans out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I'm looking forward to see how successful we will be, the collective we, in enabling this through low-code and no-code. And I read an article earlier today where somebody was was calling out like this phenomenon of low-code, no-code, and where it actually yeah. makes sense. But I think experience management is one of the places, this degree of or orchestration of data up towards the actual channel is where low code and no code as a strategy simply makes sense because it enables the market to the business user without the interference or the involvement of an yeah. engineer. Like we've seen, and this is in working with the big brands of the world, lots of backend for front end type implementations that simply end up oh, yes. being this orchestration platform, meaning it ends up True. being like this thick in your architecture. Yeah. Exactly. And it has all of the great the, the best intents of the world in order to kind of orchestrate your SaaS and microservices environment, but it also does it by hard coding how that data is actually coming together. Exactly. And this and is where you kind of normalizes it. And that's where yeah, this is it, hopefully nice. Yeah. And it's the danger that brands and businesses just need to be mindful of and go into eyes wide open to make sure that you don't end up creating almost like what feels like a sticky monolith in that experience orchestration um, and part of your architecture where it simply requires like IT interference or involvement each and every time anything from an experience standpoint needs to be optimized or changed. And it's a fine balance. It is. Exactly. And I have two ideas on that one. The first is if the agency were to build that layer, they can become very sticky for a very mm -hmm. long time. Yeah. So business-wise, that could be smart. I'm not sure your customer will be happy, but that is one of them. And the other is we're going to need the agencies 
because that's where the expertise is. A lot of expertise sits mm. at agencies. And it's, it's very interesting to kind of work with agencies to see for which kind of customer does this fit and will actually go for it because it is a paradigm shift of how people are used to working. Yeah. Um, we have a question. Let's see if I can put that on the screen for us. From Adam. So who should be more accountable for the orchestration layer, development teams, or marketing teams? That's an interesting one. So what's yeah. your take there? Um, I honestly think the accountability is shared. I know that's the easy way out of that question. It, in my opinion, it's 50, 50, hundred percent, but it, go for it, it has to, it has to be because the marketing team is the, the beneficiary, right? It's the team actually benefiting from the orchestration layer. They are the user of it and they are the ones actually making sure the orchestrations are meaningful for the customer. Whereas the development team, of course, have responsibilities and accountabilities with, for instance, it's, it's reliability. It is a very essential layer in your architecture. And I know you can go down federated architectures and all sorts of things to kind of distribute yeah. the, um, the, the potential risk of, of, of having this type of a layer in place. But there is absolutely an SRE element to it too that you can't take away from, from the development side with observability, with um, having just the right level of, of insight into how it performs and how it operates and so forth. So I need to say 50-50. I'm afraid I'm going to say the same. And the thing is, um, like if you have this orchestration or DXC layer, you kind of, the idea is that you have your design system full of components with all, like your whole language. You can actually map that to your DXC and then attach all the data that you need from all these different sources to the fields that these components want, even if they're smaller or bigger. But that somehow has to be built by a developer and a design team and a UX person and a storyteller. And so everybody needs to be involved. The, the lovely thing is that it has, it's completely agnostic. So a developer can choose where to host it or do whatever to connect to it. Nobody cares. That's what developers want. They want that freedom. Um, but then on the other hand, if you are a marketer and you want to make a new page with five things from this e-commerce and then a search result and something personalized, you don't have to call anybody. You literally do it. You go through a workflow and you publish it. And so that's, it's, it's 50, 50, but it makes it easy. Yeah. Um, so we're running up on time. So um, who is this not for, all this whole composable story? That is a loaded question too. Um, I want to say clearly it's absolutely not for everybody, meaning there are certainly businesses that should not embrace this type of a direction simply because it's potentially too complex for them to manage. What we typically see being like common characteristics of companies that are successfully embracing it and also transforming their business through it would be a multi-business model. For instance, companies mm -hmm. that are today B2B manufacturers that are looking to go direct to consumer and are looking for a piece of digital um, infrastructure to basically operate both ways to go to market. It could also be multi-banner retailers, like where you have the degree of scale in your business that you need to operate multiple businesses at the same time so you still but you still choose to align them up against common technologies and then it's clearly also global brands where you start to see their where you start to see a requirement for market fit and flexibility in the way the actual solution operate in a distinct market that could be with regards to operating a piece of digital technology that is both fitting for APAC, but also potentially North America and still having mm -hmm. room enough in your architecture for both of those experiences to be relevant to the customers. For instance, your payment options, as an example, or the way you actually compose your experience to bring another one. So those are yeah. the types of, of characteristics we typically see of companies that are successfully transforming the business through this type yeah. of an approach. I guess if you have scale, that is more than just I'm making a blog or, or something, right? Like because there's, there's lots of companies in the mid market that don't need that much, even though they think they do. They don't really need it. They mm -hmm. can take it, like they could take one CMS that they love and integrate one or two things and actually be quite happy. And I guess the moment you start to scale it up just a little, suddenly you're, you're finding these issues yeah. because yeah. there's also a thing where if you are a content editor and you're not particularly technical, you just know how to really tell your story, 
if you don't implement it the right way, you kind of have to understand all the systems that connect. But like I've worked with global companies where content editors didn't really even know what a link was. Imagine explaining to them, this is now an Algolia index and you have to make a search query. Like these words are pure black magic. Mm. And so for these kind of companies where, where you have different teams working in something, you might want to consider something that gives an interface that's so simple that kind of just takes care of things. And that's in the yeah. DXC sense, of course. And yeah. of course, if you have changing requirements, you want composable. That's, that's, that's easy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and sometimes I also see if you have multi-anything, it could be multi-channel, multi-language, multi-market, multi-brand, yeah. multi-business model, multi-anything, then Bach and Composable could also be for you simply because you yeah. actually have a piece of architecture that can operate and embrace the flexibility you need in order to be more than one thing as a business. So that's also a way of looking at it, just to kind of like tick the boxes and say flexibility, exactly. all encompassing, but it's typically in the sense of scale, right? Meaning that it's scale ambition. and this omni-channel thing is such a big thing. Yeah. Like, for example, it's the simplest example. Like, I like to learn different like coding frameworks and languages as a front-end developer, for example. So I have one microservice that gives the composition of my pages. I built that one time. But I have um, a website in Nuxt. I have a website in Next. I have a web website in Astro, which is one of those newer ones. They just all talk to that same thing. And it's completely composed. And if I wanted to make like a React Native iPhone app tomorrow, I could. And that freedom is amazing, right? The data lives in the right place. Anyways, um, I wanted to thank you so much for your time. I know this is the second um, interview of the day for you, and it's getting a bit late. Is, are there any closing thoughts on the Mac Alliance or maybe a Faltech or something you want our viewers to learn about? Anything? The only thing that just came to mind, and that is actually an addition to what you just said, is that the developer's experience and how exciting it is for employees within your business to work with technology has a pretty huge effect on talent acquisition and the type of market oh, yes. talent that you can tap into. So also remember there are angles that are not just commercially oriented or it's about innovation and all this sexy stuff, but there is equally also benefit as a business when you're talking about just your ability to attract really good, solid digital talent. And that's where yeah. Mach also plays a vital role in my opinion. Well, yeah, I don't know any developers that want to go into a legacy system and then just fix bugs. Like most developers, well, there are some. I, I know some of them. I'm sure. But that's yeah. fine. They're happy. But then others, if like the higher your talent density is, the leaner your business can be because you need less rules. People are more senior. They love their job. It's everything becomes easier. And happy people make better products. Let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with that bombshell, let's end it. Thank you so much for your time. And um, let me just put this one on. Um, if anybody wants to know a little bit more about Uniform, you can actually um, join us on Discord if you want to. Um, I would love it if you did. You don't have to, but it would be cool. And so for Casper, for you, it's, I guess, um, everybody can find you on LinkedIn. Is there anything else you want to share of where people can go? Uh, obviously, valtech.com or machalliance.org. Ah, yes. There you go. Exactly. And you're always you more than welcome to reach out if you have anything. I'm more all right. curious. So, I think we're all very curious about all this fun stuff. Um, thank you so much. And hopefully see you soon. Cheers. Yeah, likewise. Cheers.